The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the X Zone, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I'm going to be your host and your guide as together we cross the time space continuum to this place that I call the X Zone. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the X Zone comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern. On the Talk Star Radio Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, UK High Definition Radio, Euro High Definition Radio, Star Cable, and Ustream. If you'd like to give us a call, toll free worldwide, 1 800 610 7035. My email address is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On MSN Messenger, xzoneradiotv at hotmail.com. And our website, www.xzoneradiotv.com. Starting next Monday, which will be, let me see, July the 26th, we are going to start broadcasting seven days a week, 365 days a year at www.xzonetv.com. I know you've asked us to bring it back, and what we're doing is we're doing, going to be doing that. We're going to be bringing on some other shows and some other features. But starting next Monday at midnight, so let me see, Sunday night... Right into Monday morning at midnight, we flick the switch, and the Exxon Radio and TV show will be broadcasting 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days of the year at www.xzonetv.com. My guest this hour is a good friend of the Exxon. Brad Olson is a, uh, an award-winning travel writer. In February 2010, his travel book, Sacred Places, North America, the second edition, won the Bay Area Travel Writers Top Gold Prize Award. Uh, first place winner, underline that gang, uh, for the 2010 Best Travel Book for the Planet Earth category. His publication travel column for the Heartland Healing Magazine, Sacred Destinations, On the Road with Brad Olson, is currently being considered for syndication. He is also a contributing editor of and for World Explorer magazine. Brad Olson has contributed to several rough guides uh, titles, including World Party Book, and we're so happy to have Brad with us. Brad, welcome back to the X-Zone. Long time no talk, my friend. Hey, Rob. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. Hey, first of all, congratulations on your award. Man, you have worked so hard over the years. It's, it's a real great pleasure to congratulate you one-on-one. Hey, it's always great to be recognized by our peers, and uh, thank you for that. You've been busy. You've got some great things we're going to be talking about over the next hour. Um, we're going to talk to you about your passion for publishing. We're going to be talking to you about your book series. And uh, you're also, you've also got your fingers in the pie in a couple of media spotlights, so we'll also be talking about that. But Brad, as you know, being in the media, we've got to take a commercial break. So you and I will be back in two minutes. Exo Nation. Brad Olson is our special guest, www.bradolson.com or www.cccpublishing.com. This is the Exxon for Monday, July the 19th in the year 2010. My name is Rob McConnell, and uh, Brad Olson and I will be back on the other side of this commercial break in two minutes as we continue here on the Talkstar Radio Network, Exxon Broadcast Network. We are also on UK High Definition Radio, Euro High Definition Radio, Star Cable, and on Ustream. We'll be back on the other side of this two-minute commercial break. Don't go away. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere. 
Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine like hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining room can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you're visiting, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, old Florida cuisine at its best. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Brad Olson's our special guest, www.bradolson.com and www.ccpublishing.com. Uh, Brad, uh, how did you get into publishing? Well, the short story is I traveled around the world for three years, first by teaching English in Japan and financing uh, two years after that, realizing, wow, there's not a whole lot of Americans out here. I was meeting up with Canadians, mm-hmm. New Zealanders, fellow uh Canadians here in North America, but fewer uh, Americans than I like. So I started composing a book, which turned out to be my first book, called World Stompers, a Global Travel Manifesto, which is still in print in its fifth edition and uh, hopefully still inspiring Americans to get out there and see the world. Brad, uh, during your travels, did you come across mysterious sites, sacred sites? Well, that was uh, the second part of the story is that, yeah, I I intrinsically felt myself drawn to a lot of these places, Mm -hmm. unknowing that uh, someday I would be chronicling and writing all about them in a series of Sacred Places guides, which I now have four in the series. Uh, And and the power of these places is what kept me coming back and and seeking them out as I continued this three-year trip around the world. You know, a lot of our listeners may be thinking that sacred sites are only found, or mysterious sites are only found away from North America. But I, but you have found and listed several North American sites that people could actually go and visit without having to go to Europe or to Asia or to Australia, but right here in our very own backyards. And it seems to be doing uh, pretty well in this recession, because people don't mm-hmm. want to pay to go around the world. They can just jump in their car and go check out some of these sites. So it's kind of a recession-proof guide. But yeah, I found uh, North America to be one of the most compelling tales of all. I mean, when, when you say sacred places, the, the places that come to mind are like the Great Pyramids and Stonehenge, mm-hmm. Angkor Wat and Cambodia, which they all are. But to find the uh, sites right here in North America that sometimes are only a couple hours drive away is, is really exciting. Now, I understand there's a um, a very old relic that's been found in Chicago, and apparently it ties into hundreds of ancient copper mines that are found around Lake Superior. Yeah, that's right, and that's one of the most fascinating stories in uh, sacred places in North America. It's called the Wabanasi Stone, and it's actually the oldest known relic found along the banks of the Chicago River when the first explorers came through led by Indian guides. That was uh, Joliet and Marquette Mm -hmm. and uh, LaSalle. They all saw it sitting there on the banks of the Chicago River, and it's this face of a man with his eyes closed and what appears to be a goatee beard and his mouth open on a giant boulder that weighs over 500 pounds. 
And it's also on the cover of my book, Sacred Places of North America, because it is such an interesting and intriguing relic. Uh, so for a long time, like many relics that are found, nobody had an idea of what it was until somebody came up with a plausible story. That happened to have been a foot soldier who was stationed at Fort Dearborn in Chicago. And he said, well, it's probably an Indian chief. So they named it after uh, Chief Wabanasi, and the name stuck. But it didn't really fit to Indian practices. For example, Indians were not known to work in stone, at least not uh, in a sculptural way, such as what the Wabanasi stone uh, reflects, and let alone to put these features into the stone, such as a small basin on the top of the head that actually has a channel to funnel fluid down through the stone and then out of the mouth. Well, looking into the stone and, and going to the Chicago Historical Society Museum where it's stored and looking up old records, I found that there was a group of people in the 19th century who believed that indeed it may be Phoenician. Why? Because it's the only other similar type of relic found anywhere in the world, that being around the Mediterranean Sea That's right. of the famous seafaring uh, people during Roman times and even before. And one of the greatest things that the Phoenicians contributed to early society, especially around the time of Homer, was the alloy copper, which was the main ingredient, along with tin, to make bronze. And, you know, in, in all of Homer's stories, it was all about bronze. Mm -hmm. There was no talk of iron or steel then. Bronze was the strongest metal there was. And as a result, since it was so important in armaments and spears and swords, it was worth more than gold or silver. So if you knew where to get the copper to make the bronze, you're going to be a very successful merchant. And they did. And it's known throughout history that they produced quite a few bronze armaments for the various armies around the Mediterranean Sea. But where they got the copper from, nobody knows. And that answer lies right here in North America. You know, Brad, history has been known to <clears throat> be fabricated to suit those who are writing it. Uh, we know for a fact Christopher Columbus did not discover North America in 1492. Um, and uh, it has been pe through people like you that we realize that, hey, wait a minute, the Phoenicians were here. There, there must have been a very prosperous trade. And the Phoenicians, wait a sec, hold on, that's way, way back. <laughs> So, you know, what's with this, this juggling of the books of history? Why can't we just be honest? Oh, well, I'd love to be honest, and, and that's one of the whole points of writing these, these books is to mm -hmm. get people out there investigating for themselves because, you're right, history is very flawed, and uh, the convenient cookie-cutter model of yep. Christopher Columbus being the first here, like you said, it's ridiculous. Yep. We know there are many explorers from various parts of the world who came to North America, both from the West Coast and primarily on the East Coast, including, of course, the Vikings and Celts and uh, who knows how many other people. But the interesting part of the Wabanasi story and how it ties into Chicago and, as you said in the setup, uh, the copper mines mm -hmm. of, of uh, Lake Superior are uh, e even the most stodgy academic historian in Yale who would deny any... Uh, contact before Christopher Columbus, we'll have to admit there are huge amounts of copper that were extracted from these open pit mines along the northern peninsula of Upper Michigan, as well as Isle Royale and other parts in Canada around Lake Superior, which is the richest vein of copper in the world. So here you have tons of pure copper being extracted. Nobody knows where it goes. Well, I mean, just on the surface to say, oh, the Phoenicians sailed here from Lebanon and they went and picked it up and came back. That seems pretty ridiculous. But my question is, is it ridiculous? If you were to come back three years later with a boatload of copper and ultimately become a, what we would know today as a multimillionaire for the rest of your life, wouldn't that be an incentive to uh, take a little chance and go on one of these voyages? You better believe it would. <laughs> so I always say if the incentive is there, then let's build the story around that. And let's face it, everybody's wanted to be rich throughout history, so you've got a very strong motivating factor to find this copper. 
Now, if you're able to get this information from the Native American people where it is, trade with them, give them what they mm -hmm. want, and take it and leave, well, that's great. So then my uh, quest in this whole adventure was to retrace the steps. How would Phoenicians actually come here? And this is also a parallel to how other cultures from Europe and the Mediterranean would also have come here. And that's basically taking the stepping stones, what they called uh, the islands, uh, in the North Atlantic. So you'd start from the British islands, go to the Shetlands, go to the Faroes, go to Iceland, go to Greenland, and then you catch the Labrador Current, which is very strong. It's like the Gulf Coast, but from the north. And you don't even need to put up your sails. The current will take you all the way to North Carolina if you let it. But sir, certainly there's uh, riches to be found on the way. So along the line of the story of the Phoenicians, my belief is they cut through the St. Lawrence Seaway to Lake Ontario. But there's a barrier to get to the other Great Lakes that being the Niagara Falls. So what I think they did is they uh, went through the channels, or the, I'm sorry, the lakes uh, north of Lake Ontario, which is now the Trent Severn Waterway, uh, would have portaged their boat up over the Niagara Escarpment because, of course, it was an empty boat at that time, so the whole crew could have carried it up over this uh, ledge and then dropped into the lakes that lead to Lake Huron. And then you're basically at the same altitude mm -hmm. of Lake Superior. But I got to ask so, you a question at this point. How would they get back with right. a boat laden full of copper? That's where the Wabanasi stone comes in. Ah. So yes, let's say we're fully laden with copper. The, co the boat weighs much, much more than it did coming in. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole reason the city of Chicago is where it is is because it is the quickest water passage to the rivers of the Mississippi. Ah. Basically, and I grew up in Chicago, and I went there in the, city, in the suburb of Lyons, south of Chicago. There is a plaque and a big memorial. I mean, it's mostly dedicated to the uh, French trappers who were, again, told this route by the Native Americans. But if the conditions are right, especially in the spring, if it's a wet spring, you can take a boat heavily laden, get to the southern branch of the Chicago River, and it's now gone, but there had been a lake there called Mud Lake. You could actually portage with the boat still in the water and just pull the thing through, get into Mud Lake, pull it through one more time, get into the Des Plaines River, which leads to the Illinois River, which leads to the Mississippi. Boom, you're out into the Gulf of Mexico, catch the, uh, the trades the other way, and you're back to Europe. Seems like a plan. A very well thought plan. <laughs> hey, listen, you and I have to take a commercial break, old friend. Please stand by. Exo Nation Brad Olson's our special guest this hour. www.bradolson.com or www.cccpublishing.com. 1 800 610 7035, worldwide toll free. Email exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On MSN Messenger, exxonradiotv at hotmail.com. Our website, www.exxonradiotv.com. And don't forget, next Monday, live, 724 365, exxonetv.com. We'll be back. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. 
It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Brad Olson's our special guest explanation, www.bradolson.com and www.cccpublishing.com. Where, where would you say are the most historic or mysterious places in North America, Brad? Hmm, great question. Quite a few. Uh, if you like things that are really old mm-hmm. in North America, I would suggest to your listeners to check out some of the mound cities along the Mississippi River Valley or the Ohio River Valley, such as Cahokia Mounds. And most of these are now state or national parks. Uh, Hopewellian culture in Ohio and Newark, Ohio, has several ancient earthworks right in the middle of town. Uh, And up north to Wisconsin, Aztalan is profiled in my Mm -hmm. book, Sacred Places North America as well as Natchez, Mississippi, and several down in Florida, too. Uh, There's a lot of uh, similarities between these mound cities, the layout of them, as well as the pyramid cities of Central America. So some uh, historians also postulate that there had been connection between the two via the riverways and then uh, the Gulf of Mexico, which, again, isn't that far in a boat, just a few weeks. If, if, if you were even in a primitive sailboat, to sail from the Mississippi River mouth to uh, the Yucatan. So that's an interesting mm. chapter. I really like the uh, medicine wheels of the Great Plains as well. They're very evocative. Most of them are in Canada, but there are a few in the U.S., such as the Bighorn Medicine Wheel in Wyoming. And these are ancient clocks that basically tell the Plains Indians what time of year it is. So they know when to migrate, when to follow animals, or when to uh, head back south before the coming winters. And the interesting thing about the medicine wheels is most of them are covered in snow for six months a year. So they were only used seasonally when the migrating tribes would come through these regions. Brad, I also understand that in Maine, or is it uh, in, in New England, there are over what is it, a hundred mysterious stone chambers, some with long entrance hallways and solstice sightings. Um, who who do you think built them, and what would they have built, been built for? Are they, too, would they have something to do like the um, medicine wheels that we were just talking about? Probably not many similarities to the medicine wheels, apart from the fact that they both uh, had sightings. Mm. Uh, the, the chambers in New England are more situated towards the solstices, whereas uh, the medicine wheels were more geared towards looking at some of the prominent stars, but also the solstices. Now, the the chambers in New England are utterly fascinating. I was just there uh, last summer checking them out one more time. Uh, The most prominent place, if your listeners wanted to check them out, is a place in New Hampshire just over the Massachusetts border called America Stonehenge. And where it's not really like England's Stonehenge with the giant monolithic Mm -hmm. features, it does have these megalithic stone chambers in sort of a village-like setting uh, that visitors can go through and even climb into. And there's a mysterious oracle tube and a sacrificial table. Quite a fascinating spot. Uh, But there's dozens more just in the vicinity of America's Stonehenge. In fact, uh, last time I was there, the curator told me some just uh, a couple miles away, which I went and checked out. And these are just fascinating uh, monuments, uh, megalithic stones, which are characterized by giant slabs of uh, fitted rocks upon other fitted rocks, sometimes with long entrance chambers to come into uh, large beehive-like structures which, again, if we were to compare it with anything else in the world, are very similar to what the uh, ancient Celts would do, the build these beehive chambers, which were then adapted by the early Christians of Ireland. So the idea was that some of these uh, early Christian monks who were still heavily influenced by their 
Celtic heritage had used, again, the stepping stones of the Atlantic to get to North America. And there, these Celtic monks in the early years were known to be very <clears throat> hermetic. They would just like to be left alone. So if they could make their way to North America, they could get left alone pretty well, except for maybe some interactions with the Native Americans. How about the Vikings? Uh, are, are there any mysterious places in North America where we can actually study some of the Vi- the early Viking trade, the early Viking settlements, for example, with uh, Leif the Erikson? Leif Erikson, you know, he's the, one of the most prominent Vikings in, in North American history. Well, that's right. And if any uh, history could be changed, I think Columbus Day should very well be Leif Erikson Day because it's very well known and established that he was here and he created a colony that he called Vinland. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Vikings were very much no-nonsense. They would say, okay, if we saw land, this is how it looks. And the earliest uh, sighting was one of these traders coming to the Greenland colonies set up by Leif Erikson's dad, Eric the Red. And he said, yeah, we saw this land out to the west, and it was just flat lands. It looked very barren, nothing really much there. But Leif said, hey, maybe there's a place where we can get timber. And indeed, that's what Leif Erikson sailed to North America to find. Well, the, the, the most that the old stodgy academic historians will allow is that Leif Erikson set up Vinland at the northern tip of Newfoundland, which is very barren, which has very little resources, certainly no trees that they could use for their ships or houses. Uh, and I put Longsock Meadows in Sacred Places of North America. It is a very significant site. It was a Viking colony. There are plenty of artifacts that were found there that tie it into the Greenland colonies in Iceland. Mm-hmm. But I think Leif was more clever than that, and I think Leif was a lot more daring than that. And at 18, he was already sailing ships from Norway to Greenland, which is a lot farther than Greenland to North America. So give the guy credit. He was an incredible mariner, and I believe he set up Vinland exactly where he said he set up Vinland, at the place where they found grapes growing wild. And the only place along the eastern seaboard where you find that, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket Island, Massachusetts, the Concord Grapes of New York. There's a little band where you can grow grapes wild and uh, make wine. So I think without uh, much doubt, that's where Vinland was. And there are some signs that uh, they found his longhouse in a place called Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts. And then not very far away from that is the very enigmatic Newport Stone Tower in Rhode Island, which some believe was the very first church in North America built by the newly Christianized Vikings around the year 1100. So why do you think that the those who are truly prominent in North American history, whether they're from uh, whether they're from Phoenicia or or if they're from the land of the Vikings, have not received their 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 just their just uh, recognition throughout history? Hmm. Well, change seems to be very slow sometimes, and. Uh, this whole model of Columbus being the first, I mean, you and I were taught that in grade school. It's a very convenient model, and then history is built upon everything after Columbus. Well, none of that is in dispute. But why the earliest explorers don't have their part in history, it's a, it's a tough question to answer. Uh, I think maybe part of it is the recognition of the Vikings being first, uh, didn't sit well with some people. You know, rather than New England, maybe we'd be calling it New Scandinavia. Uh, they just didn't want to give the props uh, to the right people. And by the time Columbus did make it here and the first explorers made it up to New England, Viking culture, what was left of it, had been very watered down, mainly interbreeding with mm-hmm. the Native Americans. In fact, one of the first explorers of the eastern seaboard called the tribes around Rhode Island, the Narragansett tribe, they call them white Indians because they had looked so white. And indeed, there are regressive genes of the Vikings in some of the Native American populations, including multicolored eyes, red hair in some places, and uh, many traits, including uh, using the runic alphabet of the Mi'kmaq people 
in Canada, as well as some loan words that are very similar or exactly the same as what the Vikings used, including the uh, Longhouse. The Iroquois Nation of upstate New York were called the League of the Longhouse. There were seven tribes who built these very characteristic longhouses, almost exactly the same way that the Vikings built their longhouses. So go figure. I mean, if, if you look deep into the mm -hmm. record, you will find ample evidence to suggest Phoenician, Celtic, and Viking trade and contact and settlement right here in North America. Brad, I understand there's a place in California that is not unlike the Nazca lines in Peru that, that there are, that there are uh, designs that can be viewed only from the air. That's right. They're called the Blythe Intaglios, and they're uh, very much like the Nazca lines in Peru, whereas giant figurines are scraped onto the dry desert floor, uh, revealing a lighter surface of rocks. And these figures uh, are huge. They're about half the, the length of a football field and indeed are best viewed from above. How, why, and who made them is still a mystery, similar to the Nazca lines, but uh, there they are, just right along the uh, Colorado River as it bisects California and Arizona, and there are some of these intaglios uh, in Arizona as well, but mainly uh, the town of Blythe has uh, a few of them right there that are easily acceptable, accessible. Uh, I guess lastly for this uh, segment, uh, Brad, why do so many sacred mountains, especially volcanic mountains such as Mount Rainier, Crater Lake, Mount Shasta, report the highest incidence of UFO sightings in North America? What's your What's your opinion? Well, the only time I've ever had any kind of sighting was actually at Crater Lake, and I saw this uh, very perceptible band of light, and I was there mm -hmm. with other people who witnessed it exactly the same way as I did, just like a a very bright, exact streak of light head into uh, Crater Lake, like directly into it. And as we were going up to our campsite to share this info with our friends, we mm -hmm. saw it just the same way out in the distance at uh, Mount Shasta. Still don't know what it was, but as I read more and more about it, I also found that uh, volcanoes seem to harbor the most amount of UFO sightings, not only in North America, but worldwide. Why that is could be because many volcanoes are hollow on the inside. Perhaps these visitors have some sort of way of uh, getting through our <laughs> third dimensional barriers to get into these chambers where they wouldn't be harassed by uh, the governments and black ops of the world uh, chasing them around. So that's one theory. Um, why they occur at these mountains worldwide and why these mountains are also considered an ancient Native American and indigenous folklore mm -hmm. as being sacred mountains is just another intriguing part of the story. Maybe it's the aura of the mountains or maybe uh, indigenous people also had sightings there. A lot, of, um, a lot of the listeners of the Exxon have been to Mount Shasta and they all come back with their very own unique story about something that has changed their lives. And and I was wondering, Brad, if you've heard any of these stories from the many readers that you have around the world. Well, I have indeed, and I've had my own uh, mysterious experiences at Lake Shasta, or like I said, the, the sighting I mm -hmm. saw over the mountain. But I was there on uh, 7707. We were doing a peace gathering with some friends we knew up in Mount Shasta, and uh, on the 4th of July, when we were getting ready to do a, a party somewhere, this guy came over with Google Earth and he said, look at these, look at these things I found on Google Earth. And I, I've reproduced them in Sacred Places North America. There's photos of them in there. And they look like crop circles from above. And we're like, oh, we got to find these things. And we're looking all day in 100 degree heat. And just about to give up, and he said, no, 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 let's just make one more turn. Let's check out that meadow over there. And, and we found them. And they weren't crop circles, but they were mounds. And they had uh, little moats around them hmm. that were not filled with water, but had been filled with water recently. And there were two sets of these patterns. And both of them were connected by a channel 
that just went off into the distance and uh, could be filled with water. Well, somebody in our group speculated that uh, this was a way to create these lenticular clouds, which are very commonly seen around Mount Shasta, yes. which are these very distinct-looking clouds that almost look like UFOs themselves. Brad, stand by, it... buddy. You and I have got to take our final break. Okay. Brad Olson's our it. special guest, Exonation. Sacred Places, North America. Websites, www.bradolson.com dot com and www.cccpublishing.com Brad and I return on the other side of this break. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers including CNN Broadcast Network Sirius Satellite Network Star Media Good News Radio Network Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Hi, I'm Larry Lawson, host of Paranormal Stakeout. With over 36 years in law enforcement, I have learned a few things. The most important is the proper gathering and preservation of evidence is vital to putting the bad guy behind bars. It's no different in the world of paranormal investigation. Whether it's the search for the afterlife, cryptozoology, UFOs, and extraterrestrials, how we gather the evidence, preserve that evidence, and present it to a jury of our peers will make the ultimate difference in proving the existence of worlds and entities that are beyond our imagination. Join me, Larry Lawson, every week on Paranormal Stakeout when, along with my guests, we'll take a journey to prove with indisputable evidence what man has struggled to believe for centuries. Go to xzbn.net for the broadcast schedule and check me out at paranormalstakeout.com. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. Brad Olson is our special guest this hour, www.bradolson.com. Dot com and www.cccpublishing.com. We're talking about sacred places, North America. Brad, before we went to the commercial break, you were telling us about this site that uh, that might have actually provided a clue into the formation of lenticular clouds, which many times are mistaken for UFOs. That's correct. And uh, if any of your listeners have been to Mount Shasta, it can be a perfectly blue sky day, not see another cloud anywhere around except for these lenticular clouds, which seem to come at a certain altitude and just cling right to the mountain. So there was a amateur UFO expert in our group, and he's saying, well, you know, we see these things all the time. He lives up there at Mount Shasta, and nobody really knows how or where these clouds come from. They just seem to rise up and poof, there they are. Well, let's just say there was a way to excite the atoms in water to create steam. Maybe these things we found on Google Earth and then physically found on the ground were some kind of way that maybe there are people or entities that reside in Mount Shasta, and let's say they need to get out of the mountain and it's a blue sky day. Well, what can you do but create a little lenticular cloud to rise up and cling to the mountain and then... As my friend says, sometimes these lenticular clouds will actually break off from Mount Shasta and just go float away. So it would be a perfect cloaking device 
according to this source, to uh, allow ships to come and go, if that were the case. Brad, as always, great having you on the show. Um, where are your books available, and where can our listeners go to find out more about you and you know how they can actually save a lot of money and, and stay right around here in North America, visit some of these very interesting and old sites? Well, my books are available, uh, of course, at Amazon.com, any other online retailer. Uh, they should be at your favorite bookstore. If they're not, ask for them, and uh, they can order Sacred Places North America or any of my other books. Should be available. Uh, well, they're definitely on all the databases and mm-hmm. hopefully stocked in your favorite store. As always, as I was saying, uh, great talking to you. Uh, what, we've got about a minute left, uh, Brad. What, what's, what's ahead for you? What, have you? what are you working on right now? Well, I'm working on a Sacred Places TV show that hopefully will come to fruition in the near future. I'm working on a couple more books. Looks mm-hmm. like I'm going to bring out Sacred Places Around the World as a third edition next year. So I'm going to beef up that title and add some new sites and do some traveling. And life is good, Rod. <laughs> Excellent. Glad to hear it, buddy. Again, thank you very much for joining us. A great pleasure talking to you. I wish you much success, and I look forward to the next time you and I meet here in the X Zone. Hey, and if anybody wants to follow me on Facebook, I'm at CCC Publishing is my fan page, and they can get a daily report of what I'm up to. Sounds like a plan, buddy. That's Brad Ol- Olson has been my guest this hour, XO Nation, Sacred Places, North America. Two websites, www.bradolson.com and www.cccpublishing.com. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news at six and a half minutes past as the Exxon continues from our studios in beautiful Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. We'll be back after the news.